That was good, wasn't it? Amen. I'm looking forward to that day. And I hope that you will be over in the glory land. All right. We can get back to the title screen. That would be good. Uh, the evidence of faith is what I'm talking about today. Mark chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. And so if you have a Bible this morning, and I hope that you do, let's turn to Mark chapter 2, uh, verses 3 through 5. Sermon that I've titled, The Evidence of Faith. The Evidence of Faith. I wonder how many people can see your faith. I wonder how visible your faith is to those that you come in contact with on a daily basis. That's what we want to look at today. And I hope and pray that you examine your life. And um, you come to conclusion that uh, your faith is visible. And if it's not, then maybe you can do the things uh, necessary to be able to have your faith become visible, to have evidence. So the evidence of faith, Mark chapter 2, verse 3 through 5. If you have it, say amen. 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 Let's read God's Word. The Gospel, Mark chapter 2, verse 3. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near, near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was laying or lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for your presence uh, in the midst today. Lord, we thank you for your presence in our life. And, and Lord, we pray that as we um, go through the preaching of your word this morning, that you'll open our hearts. Lord, that we might receive what you put before us. Lord, that we might um, understand that faith is not something that we hold, but it is something that is visible, that is evident to those that we encounter in everyday life. And so, God, I pray, Lord, that you will help our faith to become evident to all those around us. Lord, that people might see you in us. And Lord, we pray, Lord, if there's one here today who's lost without you, you pray that today be the day of salvation. Lord, that they will come and they'll give their life to you. Lord, that you might abide with them. And Lord, that they might live and abide in you. So Lord, we thank you again for this time and this privilege. Lord, I pray that you'll use my list for your service. Hide me behind the cross, that you and you alone might be exalted. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The evidence of faith. There's a huge misconception uh, with the, within the Christian realm that says Christian's faith is a blind faith. The fact that we believe that Jesus is God and that He died and is now risen at the right end of the Father, people say that our faith is blind, that we must have blind faith. As a matter of fact, I've even heard preachers preach that you are to have blind faith. Now, just because we have never seen God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit, but yet believe they exist, does not mean our faith is blind. All right? Doesn't mean that our faith is blind. There's a difference between blind faith and believer's faith, or what I call biblical faith. So there's a difference between blind faith and, and biblical faith. Uh, Richard Dawkins He's a famous atheist and philosopher. And here's what he said about faith. He said, faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade um, the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is the belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack. Of evidence, and this is Richard Dawkins, of course, a, a self-proclaimed atheist. Now, basically, what Dawkins is saying is that faith and evidence cannot exist together. He says, if you have evidence, then you don't have faith. And so, what he says, you can't have the two together. Now, it's obvious that he knows nothing about biblical faith because biblical faith has a lot to do with evidence. As a matter of fact, that's what it's based upon. It's just that the evidence of biblical faith 
is immaterial. All right? So he's evaluating evidence as material, but the evidence of biblical faith is immaterial. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 11 1 says, and you probably know this, it'll be on the screen. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There's a lot of things that we do not see, but yet we see the evidence that it exists, right? Uh, the common illustration is wind. We know that wind exists. Although nobody's ever saw wind before, we know it exists because we see it in the trees and in the grass and things like that. So we know that wind exists. Sunday, last Sunday afternoon was a perfect example of wind existing but not seeing it. We saw the rain going uh, this way instead of this way. So it was going horizontal instead of vertical. That was evident of wind blowing, Okay. Don't see the wind, but you see the evidence. Another, uh, or at least for me, may not be for you, um, is a million dollars. Um, they say a million dollars exists. I've never seen it with my eyes, but I have seen the evidence. You go down here to the to the beach, to the island, you'll see million dollar houses. All right. You go to big cities and you see million dollar buildings. And so the evidence that million dollars exists is there, even though I've never seen, touched, or tasted a million dollars. Okay. We know that it exists. And so faith, um, there's a lot of things in life that, that exist, even though we've never seen it. All right. And so faith is a lot like that. Biblical faith and blind faith are not the same. Now, before we take a look at what biblical faith is, we got to understand what blind faith is, okay? We're not going to spend much time on blind faith because I want to spend most of my time talking about biblical faith, but I think it's uh, necessary for us to know what uh, blind faith is. Now, what Dawkins says about faith speaks to blind faith, the lack of evidence, um, which, which basically means a belief in something without evidence. An example of blind faith, and you may not agree with me on this, and that's okay, and we can talk about it at a later time, uh, but an example of blind faith is the belief in aliens, okay? A belief in aliens. Now, I do not believe in aliens. I, I just do not believe in aliens, and I won't go into why I don't, um, but believing in aliens is a blind faith. Why? Because we have no evidence, and no, the pyramids aren't evidence of aliens and the crop things that are out there, that's not evidence. I mean, that's all been proven by, by human uh, to do that. So there's not any evidence that aliens exist. And so if you believe that, then it's a blind faith. And you're entitled to believe that. I do not believe that. But um, that's an example of blind faith. But I love what C.S. Lewis um, wrote about Christian faith. And I've shared this before. It's one of my favorite quotes. Here's what he said. He said, I believe Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. What a wonderful and powerful quote if we would just let that sink in for just a moment. You see, biblical faith or Christian faith is not blind. It's not just acting out um, on a hope and a wish. It's something that has evidence. It's something that has evidence. James 2.18 says this, Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Okay? So we know that biblical faith can be evidence. It can be seen. Now, listen to, what, listen to what Paul's prayer for the people in the church in Ephesus was in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17. Pay attention to his wording here. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. He says, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. All right, that we might have that. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And so God wants us to see faith, but he also wants us to display faith, okay? And so Paul prays that for the church there in Ephesus. God does not want us walking around blindly following him. He does not want us walking around blindly following him, wishing or hoping as the world does that he is real. 
He wants us exercising faith because we know that He exists. Faith is not a hope or a wish. Faith is knowing that God exists. Biblical faith works best when we have knowledge and evidence. Okay? So biblical faith works best when we have knowledge and evidence. Now, I hope by now you kind of get what biblical faith is. It's There's evidence and there's knowledge about it. I also want you to know that faith is not... Uh, is not without evidence either, okay? If faith is not blind nor lacks evidence, then what is the evidence of faith? What does faith look like? What does faith look like? And that's the question I want to answer this morning. Let's look at verse 5 of our passage. Mark 2, verse 5. Listen to what Jesus says here. Or look what Mark writes as he quotes Jesus. He says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven you. And so I asked this question, what, what does faith look like? Jesus saw their faith, so what does faith look like? But I also want to ask you this, has Jesus seen your faith? Because obviously it's um, Jesus seeing your faith uh, means that your sins are forgiven. And so has Jesus saw your faith? And, and secondly, what does faith look like? If there's evidence and it's visible, then what does it look like? Now, we could be here all day describing exactly what faith looks like from different points in the Scripture. I mean, we could go all over the place in the Bible looking at that, but um, we're not going to do that. We're going to look in our passage this morning, and I want to show you three qualities uh, that Jesus saw in the faith of these four men. And, and I believe uh, need to be evident in our faith as well. So we're going to examine these four men, and we're going to look at their faith. We're going to see what Jesus saw, and then we want to see if we see the same thing in our life. So do we have these same qualities uh, that Jesus saw in these four men's faith in our life? The first quality that makes their faith evident is they care. These four men Cared. This is something that is missing today amongst Christians. We don't care like the Bible calls us to care about others, that is. We care a lot about ourselves. Matter of fact, we probably care too much about ourselves. Um, but here, these men, they cared about others. Look at verse 3 as we see how much they cared. Verse 3, it says, They came to him, talking about Jesus, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. So these four men uh, brought this other paralytic man uh, to Jesus. Now these four men were not thinking of themselves. All right? They weren't thinking of themselves. They were thinking of their friend who had a need. Okay? And they went to a lot of trouble to get him the help that he needed. Why? Why did they do that? Why did they go through all that help? Carrying this man to Jesus. Why did they do that? Well, the reason is that he was important to them. This paralytic man was important to these other four men. They cared about him. Okay? They cared about this man. You care about what's important to you. You care about what's important to you. Listen, if the church is not important to you, then you won't care about the church. If your children aren't important to you, then you won't care about the children. You, you, it's just the way it is. If, if your car is not important to you, then you won't care about your car. If your house is not important to you, then you won't care about your house. What, you, what, you, um, what is important to you, you care about. And this man was important to these other four men, and so they cared about him. They cared about his well-being. They cared about who he was and who he is. You care about what is important to you. Someone, someone once said this, and I have no idea who said it, but I love this quote. It goes like this. They won't care how much we know until they know how much we care. They won't care how much we know until they know how much we care. As the body of Christ today, we've got to be a people who truly care about the needs and welfare of others. It's a biblical mandate. We need to be a people who care about the needs and the welfare of others. Paul wrote in Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. What does that mean? That means care. When somebody's happy, celebrate with them. When somebody's mourning or weeping, you weep and mourn with them. That's showing that you care to them. 
So we have a call to care all throughout the Bible. We see these four men caring, and that was an evidence of their faith. That was evident of their faith. See, get involved in the lives of others. Get involved in the lives of others. It's so easy, church, to sit back and be wrapped up in our own lives and in our own problems. Because if I was to take a survey right now and ask, how many of you have problems in life? I know that the majority of you would raise your hands, whether it's health problems, financial problems, uh, or, or whatever kind of problems, family problems or whatever, car problems, no matter. So we have problems in life, okay? Life's not easy, right? Life's hard. And, but it's so easy to get caught up in our own problems. It's so easy to get caught up in our own solution or in our own situations that we miss what everybody else is going through. All right? We miss that. And so it shows that we don't really care about other people. So we get so wrapped up in ourselves that we don't act like we care about anybody else. But what a tremendous difference it would make if we would just look around. If we would just look around and look out for people who have needs. And not so that we can avoid them, right? That's what we like to do. We like to see who's needy and we try to avoid them. Well, I... Every time I go around that person, they're always wanting something from me. You know, we don't need to avoid people like that. We need, to, we need to do everything within our power to meet needs of people. All right? So we need to help people. It might be a brother or sister in the church. There may be somebody you're sitting next to, in front of, behind of this morning who may need help, who may need you to do something in their life. But you won't know because you're not trying to pay attention to them. You're trying to avoid them and their need. But listen... There might be somebody in the midst this morning who needs your help. It might be someone who needs someone to talk to. Listen, they're not just trying to get you to come over to the house and build them something or give them some money or to make them some food or something. That's not what it's always about. A lot of times it's just so that they can have somebody to talk to. The other week we met with um, uh, some people within the community and they were talking about the 911 calls that come in and the repeat 911 callers. And I was, I was amazed at what they said. They said some people call 911 just to let somebody know that they're still living right here in Onslow County. That is amazing to me. They just want somebody to talk to. And so there may be somebody sitting around you who just wants somebody to talk to. They're not wanting you to do anything else than maybe just pick up a phone and give them a call. And that's really not that difficult when it comes to meeting a need in someone. So there may be somebody here for that. It might be that someone needs um, some help with housework. Maybe they're just not able to do it. And you see that they're not able to do it, but you don't ever ask. Maybe they need help with housework. Maybe they need a ride to the store or something. I don't know. Uh, but you don't know either because you're not looking around. And so I challenge you to look around. It might be someone who's just anxious to learn more about God's Word, who has a question about the Bible. Listen to me. They won't care how much we know, all right, or even who we know, which is Christ, right? They won't care how much we know or who we even know until they know how much we care. And nobody wants to hear about Jesus until you show that you care for them. Because how in the world can we show them Jesus or share with them Jesus when we don't even do what Jesus did. And that is care for others. So that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What the Bible says. And so that means more than just expressing concern. I said this last week. I said this week. Don't just tell somebody you're going to pray for them. Pray for them right then. Don't just tell them I'm going to pray for you. Pray for them right then. It actually means helping people out with their problems. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 16 says this. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? In other words, you say you have faith, but you don't ever do anything to display it. So if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Do we really care about people, church? Do we really care about people? We got VBS coming up. We got VBS coming up. And, and, and a good way to show you care about the children, if you haven't already signed up and are serving in some way, shape, or form, is to show up and love on these kids. Listen, you can show up to church on Sunday morning. So I'm not leaving anybody out here. 
All right? And I'm not saying this because I want to see a bunch of adults here. I'm saying this because these kids need to know that you care about them. And so maybe you can't teach. Maybe you can't run around in recreation. And, and maybe you can't clean up the fellowship hall for snack. But I guarantee you, you can show up here about 545. And as the kids file in here, you can go from pew to pew and talk to these kids. Learn these kids' names. Let them know that you love them and that you care for them. There is a place here for you. Or maybe you can't get here at 6 o'clock or 545 to welcome the kids in. Well, they'll go to snack somewhere around 6.50 or something like that. You can be over there, and when they come in, you can talk to them and, and, and just, you don't even have to do anything. You don't have to teach them nothing. Just come up, give them a hug. Be here to hug the kids. We need kid huggers, all right? And it doesn't take anything to do that. Show you care to these kids. That's just, that's just a way uh, to do it. That's the way you show that you love, all right? All you need to do is show up, talk to the kids. Show you care. Be here. I'm not trying to, you know, convict anybody. I'm not trying to, you know, talk anybody into it. I'm just saying, look, if you care, then there's something you can do. There's a way that you can be a part. Uh, Jesus saw four men with a friend that cared. We need to have the same, um, we need to have the same kind of faith that these men had. They cared about uh, these, these, uh, this man. We need to be a people who care about one another and the people who care about the physical and the spiritual needs of the world around us. We need to be a church, Providence Baptist Church, a church who cares about the needs and the peoples of the, those around us. So the second quality, first quality is they care. Number two, the second quality that makes their faith evident is they wanted Christ known. These four men wanted Christ known. Look at verse 4. It says, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, talking about come near to Jesus, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralyzed, the paralytic was laying. These four men, all right, didn't want to take their paralytic friend to a football game. They had no desire to take their friend to a football game. They had no desire to take him down to the pier to do a little bit of fishing. They had no desire to take him somewhere where he could have fun. Their desire was for him to come to Christ. They wanted Christ to be known. And that made all the difference in his life. The church needs to be a people with a faith that is anxious to make Christ known. Your faith will be evident by your desire to make Christ known. So do you desire to make Christ known? Do you want people to come to Christ? Like the Apostle Andrew, for example. Uh, Andrew is not one of the um, famous disciples. He wasn't in the inner three, Peter, James, and John. Uh, but everywhere we see Andrew in the New Testament, he's always bringing somebody to Jesus. He brought Peter, his brother, to Jesus. You remember the little boy who, who had the, uh, the five loaves and the two fishes? You remember that, feeding the 5,000? You know who brought that boy to Jesus? Andrew. Do you remember the Greeks uh, who were wanting answers? And who was it, who was it, the one who was the one who brought the Greeks to Jesus? It was Andrew. Andrew is seen all throughout Scripture bringing people to Jesus. He wanted Christ known all throughout the Scripture. He's bringing not that he was spectacular. He wasn't Peter. He wasn't James. He wasn't John. He wasn't a part of that inner three. But every time we see Andrew, he's bringing somebody else to Christ. All right. That's also the goal of every other believer. To bring people to Christ. And so he, you may be here and say, well, I don't know how to lead anybody to Christ. That's all right. You, know, you have a pastor. You have deacons. Introduce them to them. Let, let them introduce them to Christ. If you don't know how, but let me tell you something, though. If you don't know how, then I would challenge you to come to me and allow me or, or somebody, one of our leaders, to um, help you so that you learn how to show somebody Christ, lead somebody to Christ. That would be important for you to know, especially Vacation Bible School. But we need to be bringing people to Christ. We need to have a desire to make Christ known. And so I ask you, do you, want to, do you want Christ to be made known? Do you want to make known Christ? Then you care about people and you bring people to Christ. Care about people, bring people to Christ. You want your evident, you want your faith to be evident, then care about people, bring people to Christ. Number three, the third quality that makes their faith evident is they were determined. This is where some toes will get stepped on a little bit, but I do not apologize for that. I'm just going to preach the word. They were determined. We don't have enough determined people in church today. Let's read how determined they were. Verse 4 again. 
And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, we hate crowds, right? We run from crowds, especially from June to September. We run from crowds. We try to avoid crowds, right? But it says, and, and when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, um, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was laying. See, these men were determined. They weren't deterred by the crowd. Uh, they were determined. These four men brought their friend to Jesus. But when they got to the house, when they got near the house, as a matter of fact, they saw that there was no room to get through. They couldn't make their way through. Now let's make this a little more personal here. If that had been you in their place, if you would have been one of the four carrying this friend of Jesus, what would you have done when you arrived to the house that you knew Jesus was at and you see this crowd out in the streets and you couldn't even get to the front door? What would you have done? Would you sit back and wait for the crowd to leave? Or would you say, let's just go home, we'll never get in? What would you do? I mean, be honest. If that was you, when you come up to that crowd and you know your friend had a knee, what would you do? Would you wait it out? Would you have pushed through the crowd? What would you have done? Or would you have just gone home? Let me say this. If they had quit, if these four men would have quit, they'd have a good excuse. They'd have a good reason to go home. They couldn't get in. They couldn't get through. They couldn't get to where Jesus was. They had a good reason, a good excuse for what it looks like to us. But church, they wasn't looking for a way out. They were looking for a way in. They weren't looking for a way out. See, we're guilty so oftentimes. How can we get out of this? How can we get out of that? How can I just weasel myself through this so I don't have to do it? Yeah, I know I committed, but um, I don't really want to do it. So how can I get out of this? We have so many people who are looking uh, to get out of doing things or looking for a reason to get out of doing things, even in the church. As a matter of fact, let me say, especially in the church trying to get out of doing things instead of being determined to find a way in. They always seem to have a reason. People always seem to have a reason for their unfaithfulness to the Lord. They're called excuses, church. They're called excuses. But these four men had a faith so great that it refused to quit. Refused to quit. And they refused to quit in the midst of setbacks. They didn't want to quit. They didn't want to give up. They couldn't bring themselves to say, we can't do it. They were determined that nothing would stop them from seeing Jesus. Their friend was sick and Jesus had the power to heal. And they were determined to bring their friend to Jesus. They were determined to bring the two together. This whole ordeal, I would imagine, grew their faith. Tremendously. Because, listen church, difficulties test us. Therefore, they cause our faith to grow. And if you don't hear anything else I say this morning, I want you to hear this one thing, okay? I want you to hear this one thing. It'll be up on the screen. You see, our failures as a church, our failures as individuals, generally lie not so much in our obstacles or problems as they do in our lack of faith. Let me say that again. Our failures as a church and our failures as individuals generally lie not so much in our obstacles and problems, you know, the things that we go through as they do in our lack of faith. That's where our failures come from. Not because of the obstacles, although that's what we'll say. It comes as a lack of faith. These men had great faith. So there are too many who will cry, it can't be done. It can't be done. And until we put forth effort, until you put forth effort, it won't be done. But so much can be accomplished when we recognize the power of God. So we underestimate the power of God. The Lord's work has not always been accomplished by talented people. The Lord's work has not always been accomplished by intelligent people. The Lord's work has not always been accomplished by strong people. And so I know many people sit on the pews and they say, well, I'm not smart enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not talented enough, I'm not this enough, I'm not that enough. Listen, then you're perfect for what God wants. But the work of God has always been accomplished by people who believe in the power of God, who did what they could and relied on God to supply the rest. 
So here were four men who refused to have a defeated attitude. We've got to have an undefeated attitude. We can't be defeated. There were some obstacles in the way, yes. There were probably some people who said it couldn't be done. There were probably some people who say, what do you think you're doing? But their faith led them to put forth the effort, and the Lord rewarded them. This is not my notes, and I know it's time to go, but listen to this. I thought this was good as I was praying and studying this morning. Do you realize that these men, they didn't, they didn't do the traditional orthodox way of doing things, you know, like going through the front door? Because it wasn't working, it couldn't get to it, it didn't work. You know what they did? They thought outside the box. And they decided to go through the roof. Church, sometimes if we want to reach people for Christ, we've got to think outside the box. And so sometimes you may, you may hear an idea come from me or come from somebody else or come from another committee and you're thinking to myself, but I don't know, we ain't never done nothing like that before. That's kind of crazy sounding. Look, it's okay. Think outside the box sometimes. These men, they didn't, they didn't come ortho, like they supposed to through the front door because it just wasn't working. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work going through the front door. And so they decided to go through the roof. They thought outside the box. And so church, maybe in order to reach people for Christ, in order to bring people to Christ, we're probably going to have to start thinking outside the box. Because going through the front door anymore doesn't work. So just something to think about as we try to bring people to Christ or as we try to bring Christ to people. So in closing, these four men's action made their faith evident to Jesus. For verse 5 says that Jesus saw their faith. But not only did Jesus saw, but others saw their faith as well. Our actions will make our faith evident to the world. Our actions will make our faith evident to the watching world. Biblical faith is an evident Visible faith that works. In these four men, Jesus saw faith. He saw determination. He saw concern and care for others. What faith does Jesus see in us? Does he see that we care? Does he see that we're determined? What evidence of faith do we have in our lives? The Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith. Faith is critical to salvation. If faith is evident, then can people see that you're saved? Can people see that you are a child of God? And I ask in closing, are you a Christian? Are you a believer? Have you ever given your life to Christ? Have you ever accepted by faith Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? If not, won't you come as we close?